guy who holds a world record for marathon running. His name is Bob Weiland. He doesn't hold a record for the fastest marathon runner. He holds records for the slowest. In New York City, he ran a marathon in 1986, and where other people who were able to run that race in three or four, some even five hours, it took him 98 hours to cross the finish line. Think about that. Days it took him to cross the finish line. But that wasn't even the one that wrote the record. The record was in Los Angeles in 2003. It took him 173 hours to run that marathon and to cross the finish line. But he holds a record for being the slowest guy to run a marathon. But in my opinion, he ought to hold the record for being the best athlete to ever run the marathon because he ran those marathons on his hands. Can you imagine that? He had, you know why he ran them on his hands? Because he had no legs. In Vietnam, he was, he was over there, and one of his buddies was coming under fire, and he was going to go rescue his buddy. And when he did, he stepped on a landmine, and he ended up in the hospital. And he wrote this short note back to his parents. He said, Dear Mom and Dad, I'm in the hospital. Everything is going to be okay. Don't worry. The people here are taking good care of me. Love, Bob. P.S. I think I lost my legs. And he did lose his legs, but instead of giving up on life, he went on to become an incredible athlete. He has walked across the entire United States. It took him three years, eight months, and six days to do it, but he walked from border to border on his hands. He not only did that, but he competed in a triathlon. In that, he swam two and a half miles. He biked 112 miles using his hands on the bicycle and then ran the marathon. He has twice made 6,200-mile round-trip bike rides across the United States. He has won medals in weightlifting, including once he bench-pressed 570 pounds. And the NFL's Players Association have named him the most courageous man in America. I think they might be right, don't you? A guy who not only had courage in Vietnam to save a friend and sacrifice his own life, but who's gone on to be this incredible athlete using just his hands. But when it comes to being Christians, believers, what is it that makes us courageous? The Bible tells us it's faith. Amen? It's not what we can do physically, but what we can do spiritually. And tonight we're going to look at somebody who is considered a champion of faith. She made it in Hebrews chapter 11. She made it in the hall of faith. God listed her name among those champions who showed incredible faith, one of the most courageous people ever. Her name is Rahab. She's not somebody we expect to find in that chapter, not somebody we expect to find up there with, with Abraham and Sarah and Moses and David, not somebody we expect to find in the lights with all those others because she was a prostitute. She lived in the city of Jericho. You know Jericho from the Bible side of the story. You know Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. We always look at it from that perspective. But tonight, look at it from inside the walls of Jericho. Look at it from the perspective of this prostitute who is not a believer. She's not raised as a Hebrew. She doesn't know anything about the God of the Old Testament. She is a Canaanite, idol worshippers. There are people who worship stone and wood and all these idols and temples, and that's all she's ever known, an idol worshiper who's a prostitute in this Canaanite city of Jericho. But all of a sudden, some, some rumors have been going around. People have been talking about some stuff. It, it's going all over town, the, the stories that are going back and forth. People are talking about it when they're in line at Walmart. They're talking about it sitting at the table at Pizza Hut. I think Jericho had to have Walmart and Pizza Hut. Every great city's got those things. i got to tell you, when... When they tore down our Pizza Hut a few years ago to rebuild, that was one of the hardest years of my life. But with God's help, we made it through. But Jericho, there they are in lines and sitting over meals and all these other things. And they're telling the stories. People are saying, did you hear? Did you hear about these people that have just, they're settling on the other side of the Jordan. Over there in the plains of Moab, there's millions of them but putting out their tents and they're camping out there. Have you heard about them? Yeah. And they begin to tell the stories they've heard. Well, I heard that 40 years ago they were a bunch of slaves back in Egypt. And Pharaoh was, was driving them really hard. And they decided they were going to leave. And they started to leave. But they came up on the Red Sea. Pharaoh's army was right behind them. And you can believe it if you want to or not. But I heard that the Red Sea parted. And they walked across on dry ground. And God swallowed, or the, the Red Sea swallowed up all of the Egyptian soldiers. Somebody else said, well, I heard once they got out there, you know, they've been walking around for 40 years out there in the wilderness. And what do they have to eat? They, don't, they didn't stop anywhere to raise crops. They didn't stop anywhere to have a farm. And they're not moving herds of cattle around. Where are they getting food for all these 40 years? Somebody said, well, you know, I know it sounds strange. I heard that every morning they get up that, that food has actually come down from heaven. And from what I understand, it kind of looks like flour laying on the ground. And they just scoop it up and they make all kinds of cakes and breads and all of this stuff out. of it. It's been going on for 40 years. Somebody else says, well, for surely after 40 years, they've got to look like they're absolutely homeless. 40 years out there in the desert sun, their clothes have got to be tattered and their shoes have got to be falling off. And somebody says, well, 
I have a cousin, he was up in the mountains the other day, and he looked down in the valley, and he saw him, and he says they look just as good as they did the day they left Egypt. Clothes don't have a hole, not even a snag. Forty years, no new clothes, no new shoes. Somebody says, well, what about all the enemies they face? And all the, I mean, out there, they had to face enemies out there, and, and other nations, and wars, and battles, and all this. What's happening there? Well, again, they're not soldiers. They're shepherds. They're farmers. They're all of these things. But, but evidently, their God has delivered them from all these other nations. And then finally, somebody spreads the big news. And did you hear this one? Did you hear that the reason all these things have happened is because their God told them it was going to happen? From what I understand, their God actually told them hundreds of years before that he was going to deliver them from Egypt and bring them into our land. And all of a sudden, the land of Canaan is no longer going to be the land of Canaan. It's going to be the promise land. He's giving it to those people. Now, you can imagine how nervous the city of Jericho is because now the rumor is that spies have infiltrated the city, two of them. Joshua was a pretty smart guy. If you remember 40 years earlier, he was one of 12 spies that Moses sent out, right? And they came back and 10 of those spies said, we cannot conquer that city because all the giants that are out there. But Joshua and Caleb, those two faithful spies, they said, we can do it because God said we can. I got to tell you, I think Joshua is a pretty smart guy. I think he said, forget the 12. I'm just going to pick two men of faith who know the word of God and believe God. And they are going to be people who say, we trust God. And I think that's what he did. These two spies have infiltrated the city. Now people are beginning to talking about it. We hear about being spied on a lot in the last couple of years. We've heard about presidential campaigns spying on one another. Who did this and who did that? We've heard about people and nations spying on one another. But these are spies who slipped into the city so they can bring a report back to Joshua about what's going on. You know, I love the fact that we have Google Maps that you can open it up and you can find where you're going and see the roads and all this. And you can zoom down and see buildings if you're looking for where to get into some place. But it's a little unnerving that anybody in the world can zoom right down on your house. Isn't that just a little unnerving? There was actually an article in the news two weeks ago that talked about how you can put a spot over your house on Google Maps so it blurs it out so people can't see it. But this was a day where they didn't have drones and satellites and all that. If you were going to find something out, you had to do it personally. So these two spies walk into the city, and they just happen to bump into Rahab. She says, you got to come back to my house, and you got to come right now. They say, why? She said, because the king of this city has heard that you're here, and he's sending soldiers to look for you. you got to come. And they go to her house, and she closes the door, and she says, let me tell you something. She says, our people have heard about you guys. We've heard about the Hebrews. We've heard about all your God has done. We've heard all these things, and the people are really nervous. That's why they're trying to find you. She said, go up on the roof, and I'm going to cover you up, and they're not going to know that you're here. And they come knocking at the door, the soldiers do. She opens it up. They said, we've heard those two Hebrew spies are, are in your house. And she says, well, they were in my house. Yes, they came by, and they stopped by, but they took off a long time ago. In fact, just as the city gate was closing, they ran underneath it. They're long gone, but if you go that way, I think you can still catch them. And so they took off after them. Some people say, wait a minute, this she lied. And I can't believe that God would honor somebody for lying. Well, let me remind you, she's a Canaanite. She's never heard of the Ten Commandments. She doesn't know that God's given a law. She doesn't know what right and wrong is. She's not doing this out of her own uh, self-interest. She's doing this to help somebody else. And so God looks on this woman who knows very little, but she still has faith. She says, I believe in your God. They come down and she says, listen, I believe your God is giving you this city. Her house was right on the wall, which means that it's the strongest, most fortified part of the city. And she said, I believe your God is giving you this city. And she said, I'm only asking one thing. She said, because I have protected you and even risked my own life in doing it, she said, I'm asking you that when God gives this city to your, your people, that you would spare me and my family. And here's what they say to her in answer to this. Joshua 2, verse 17. The men said to her, we'll, we will be blameless of this oath of yours, which you've made us swear, unless when we come into the land, you bind this line of scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you bring your father and your mother and your brothers and all your father's household to your home, so it shall be that whoever goes outside the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head. We will be guiltless, and whoever is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head if a hand is laid on him. And if you tell this business of ours, then we will be free from your oath, which you made us swear. Then she said, according to your words, so be it. And she sent them away, and they departed, and she bound the scarlet cord in the window. Now that's a pretty strange thing to say, isn't it? When they say, listen, we're coming back and we don't know how, but God's going to give us this city. And they say, we're only asking you to do one thing. And they pull out a red rope, wherever they got it from, I don't know, but they pulled it out. They said, all we're asking you to do is, is throw this rope and let it dangle from your window. And if you do that, everybody that's inside your house is going to be safe and protected. But anybody that steps out of that, they're going to be, it's all going to be on them. God's not, he's not making a promise to protect them. Here's the way Hebrews puts it in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 31. By faith, 
the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. I want you to see that by faith, she did not perish. I want you to see uh, this man we talked about who walked on his hands. He's a courageous man. She was a courageous woman of faith, and she was saved by faith. First tonight, let me talk to you about the wrong kinds of faith. The first is secondhand faith. The fact is we cannot live our faith based on somebody else. Do you believe that tonight? You've got to have faith for yourself. I've told you many times before, but if you ever get uh, season passes to Silver Dollar City, and I know a lot of you do from time to time, they always come with friend passes. And at certain times of the year, you can take somebody with you, and you can take them along, and you can say, they're with me, I paid for the ticket, they're with me, and you show them your ID, and they let that person in on your ticket, right? It's a friend pass. There are no friend passes to faith. It doesn't work that way. Nobody gets to heaven on somebody else's coattails. Nobody else experiences the blessing of God on somebody else's coattails. It's great to have a heritage of faith, but we can't live off of that. Paul said to Timothy, he said, I, I'm excited when I call to mind that faith that was in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. He said, but now I know that faith is in you. I want to tell you tonight, listen, if you have a godly heritage, if you have parents and grandparents and great-grandparents that served the Lord and were faithful to church and they were good Christian people, that's a wonderful godly heritage, but that alone will not get you to heaven. Did you know that? You have to have personal faith. You can't have secondhand faith. Rahab didn't have somebody else's faith. She wasn't skating in on somebody else's coattails. She believed for herself. There's also not only secondhand faith because Jesus one day talked to the disciples and he said, I know what other people are saying, but who do you say that I am? You've got to have that real, that personal faith, but not only secondhand faith, but sign demanding faith. One time the disciples came to Jesus and other people and Jesus looked at them and he said, you people will by no means believe unless you see signs and wonders. He said, but it's an adulterous generation that seeks for a sign. And he said, I'm not going to give you any sign, he said, except one, the sign of Jonah. Now, here's what Jesus was saying. He wasn't saying he wouldn't work miracles. He did work miracles. But he said, I'm not going to give you any other proof that I am the Son of God except one, the sign of Jonah, that just like Jonah was in the belly of the well three days and three nights, I'm going to be in the grave three days and three nights, that on day number three, I'm coming out of that grave like Jonah came out of that well. Sign demanding faith. We don't go to God and we don't say, listen, I want a sign. People do that all the time. They say, I want you to do this, Lord. I want you to prove it to me. Listen, God does not have to prove anything to us. We don't need a sign to trust God. we got to have faith that lives beyond signs. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who can look at the king and say, you know what? You can throw us in that furnace. We know our God is able. We know our God can extinguish the flames of that furnace. We know our God can deliver us. But if he does not, we still will not bow. Amen. That's real faith. Real faith is saying, I believe God can do it. But real faith is also saying, but if he doesn't do it, I still trust him. So there's sign demanding faith and there's self-centered faith. Faith that says, I only want God when he can do something for me. I know too many people like that. Do you know some of those? You've, been, you've known them for years, and all of a sudden they say something about being a Christian. I didn't know they were a Christian. They never went to church. I don't ever remember them talking about the Bible, the Scripture. I don't ever remember them praying. But, boy, every time something bad happens in their life, then all of a sudden, pray for me, pray for me. That's self-centered faith. You know what James said about self-centered faith? He said, if you pray like that, he said, praying that it's only on your own desires. He said, don't expect God to answer those kind of prayers. So there's self-centered faith. But Rahab was not a person who had sign-demanding faith. She wasn't asking them to prove it. She wasn't a person who had second-hand faith. She believed for herself. And so tonight, let's look at her and see what real faith does. Number one, real faith hears. She heard the word of God. They told her, they said, this is what God is saying, that if you put that red cord in your window and anybody that's in your house is going to be saved. And she believed that. That's real faith is hearing the word of God. Did you know tonight that your faith will never outgrow, your faith will never exceed your knowledge of the word of God? It can't. Because real faith is taking God at his word. That's what faith is. You can't believe God for something you never knew that he said he would do. Rahab heard the word of God. You know what Paul said to the Romans? He said, how are these Gentiles, how are they going to call on somebody they've never heard of? How are they going to believe on somebody they've never heard of? And how are they going to hear unless somebody tells them? You know what Paul was saying? You cannot believe if you don't hear. That's why Paul, Paul, Paul followed it up by saying, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Your faith will never be stronger than your knowledge of the Word of God. If you want greater faith in your life, open the Bible and begin to read it and hide it in your heart and trust it. That's real faith. Faith hears. And secondly, real faith believes. Not only did she hear the Word of God, but she believed the Word of God. 
They said, put this cord outside of your house, and she believed that. Here's what Jesus said. He said, if you can believe, all things are possible to those who believe. But you have to believe. That's what he said. That's what she did. She believed. Now, I've got to tell you tonight, it seems a little ridiculous. Doesn't it seem ridiculous on her part? If somebody looked at me and said, the only way you're going to be saved is by laying a red cord out of your window, I'd think they were nuts, wouldn't you? I mean, nobody's going to be saved by dangling a red cord out of their window, but there was one thing that made the difference. They didn't say it. God did. It's amazing how things change when you know God said it. Amen. She looked at them and she said, you're not coming up with this. You're God said it. And even if it makes no sense to me whatsoever, I believe. And she hung that red cord out of the window and she believed. And you know what? God saved her just like he said he would. The truth is, I know that it sounds ridiculous. Paul even said to some, it sounds like absolute madness. It sounds like absolute nonsense, the preaching of the gospel. People think that's ridiculous to think that one man who could die on a cross and shed his blood could save everybody in the world. How does that make any sense at all? Well, we know that he wasn't just a man. We know he was a son of God. But I got to tell you, no matter how ridiculous it sounds, I believe like Paul did, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is a power of God to salvation. And it doesn't have to make sense to me. God came up with the plan of salvation, and all I have to do is believe that. And so she believed it. How can we believe tonight? Number one, by accepting the faith that we have. Some people say, I don't have any faith. That's ridiculous. The Bible says in the book of Romans, to each one God has given a measure of faith. Did you know that? Every man, woman, boy, and girl who's ever breathed on this planet Earth was given a measure of faith. How do we know that? Because children are not born atheists. They're just not. Go in the toddler class. Go in the little classes we have around here and start talking to kids. Children are not born atheists. People develop into atheists. They're born with faith in their heart. God has put that measure of faith in their heart. But as they begin to grow, they begin to extinguish that faith. And they begin to fill their hearts with doubts and this and that and skepticism. And they turn into atheists. But God doesn't make anybody like that. God has put faith in our hearts. So accept the faith you have. Number one, accept it. Secondly, add to it. You can add to your faith. Paul told the Thessalonians, he said, your faith grows exceedingly. Isn't that great? He said, you believe more now than you did the last time I was here preaching at your church. He said, you are a greater people of faith now than you were the last time I saw you. Your faith grows exceedingly. He told Timothy, he said, pursue faith. I don't know about you. I want to have more faith tomorrow than I've ever had in my life. Is that your prayer tonight? I want to believe God for greater things. I want to believe God for greater things in this generation and for my kids and grandkids and yours. I want to believe God. I want to have greater faith. We can add to our faith. How do we add to it? Number one, by confession. Now, listen, I want to be careful. I'm not talking name it, claim it stuff. We don't just get to say whatever we want and God does it. That's not how it works. No, name it and claim it is you name what God says and claim that. That's what name it and claim it is. And Jesus said, if you speak to the mountain, be thou removed. I want to tell you, I think we would unleash an incredible amount of power as believers if we came to realize how much power there really is in our tongues. If we quit walking around griping and complaining and speaking negative and talking about all the problems and we started speaking faith in the word of God and all that God can do, I'm telling you, we can confess and we grow our faith by confession. That's what Jesus said. Speak the word, he said, in confession. Also by our company, be careful the people you surround yourself with. Be careful the friends you put around you because they will affect you one way or the other. If you don't believe me, just ask Joshua. He could think back 40 years early and he could think, we've wasted 40 years walking in this wilderness. 40 years we could have had all the good things of the promised land, but instead we were out there in the wilderness. Why? Because of 10 people. The Bible says 10 people, those 10 faithless spies, turned the hearts of the entire nation. You know why? Because doubt is contagious. You better be careful who you surround yourself with. Doubt is contagious. You get around people who start doubting and who start what if and what if. It's not very long before all of a sudden you start to be brought down by that. That's why when Elisha told that woman and her son, that widow and her son, he said, go and collect all the vessels you can from your neighbors and take that little flask of oil and go into the house. And then you remember what he said? And shut the door and start pouring. You know why? He said, shut the door on those doubters. When Jairus' daughter had died and Jesus comes with Peter and James and John, he takes mom and dad and they go in that house and they shut the door on everybody else. Why? Because there comes a time in our lives, folks, listen, we can love people and pray for them, but there comes a time to shut the door on doubters, to shut the door on unbelievers and say, I'm not going to let them drag me down. So we got to be careful about the company. Company can affect your faith. Communion can affect your faith. I'm not talking about drinking grape juice and crackers. I'm talking about the time we spend with the Lord. It will affect our faith. 
If you have ever been to Yellowstone National Park, you know that there is, the, there is that geyser that blows up there all, every couple, I guess about an hour and a half that it goes on, and it's called Old Faithful. And it happens almost the exact same amount of time, just routinely, all day, every day. And if you'd never seen it before, and you thought that's ridiculous to think that thing goes off, it's, there's no machine attached to it, there's no pump, it's just a natural occurrence, there's no way that happens at that regular interval like that. You know all that it would take to convince you? Stand around a few days and watch it. Would that not convince you? you? It may take some longer than others. Some might have to stand there for a couple of weeks and watch it. But eventually every one of us would watch it and watch our watches and finally say, you know what? It really does. It, I've watched it day after day after day, and it really is old faithful. Can I tell you, I know a greater old faithful than a geyser sitting in some national park. It is God Almighty. And I'm telling you, if you don't believe that, spend some time in his presence and learn that his mercies are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Communion will change our faith. The more we walk with the Lord, the greater faith we're going to have. But here's the next thing we can do to grow our faith, and that is to ask for it. How many believe tonight? Quick poll. How many believe God answers prayer? Raise your hand if you believe God answers prayer. If there's ever a prayer God, I believe, will answer, it is, Lord, give me more faith. He said, ask and it shall be given. I believe the disciples asked. They said, Lord, increase our faith. And he did that for them. I believe that he'll increase our faith if we trust him and if we ask him to do that. I believe if we go down our knees and say, Lord, give me greater faith, I believe that he will do it. Just like that father that came to him that day and said, Lord, my son is demon-possessed. Will you heal him? And Jesus says, if you believe. You remember what that father said? He said, I do believe, Lord, but... Help thou my unbelief. I don't know if you've ever prayed that prayer before, but I don't mind telling you, I've prayed it many times. I have prayed it many, many times when I'm praying and I finally look up and say, Lord, help my unbelief. I'm trying to have as much faith as I can, but help my unbelief. God will increase our faith. So faith hears and faith believes. And here's the next thing, faith obeys. She took that red cord, and because they told her to do it, she put it outside the window, and she said, I may not understand this. It may not make any sense. I may be the laughing stock of this whole city, but I'm not just going to believe it. I'm going to obey what they said because she knew believing wasn't enough. Did you understand that? She knew being a nice person was not going to save her. They'd already told her that. You've been a great person. You've been a nice person, but that's not going to save you. Only obeying what we said is going to save you, and she believed that. That's how it works with faith. Only obeying the Lord. One day Jesus hopped in a boat that belonged to Peter. And he said, put us out there in the deep. And Peter's too tired. He's only doing it because it's the master telling him. But Peter's exhausted. He hadn't slept at all last night. He said, Lord, all night long. Do you understand? We didn't even break for a nap. All night long we fished. And we caught not a little bit, not just a few. We caught zero. Everybody knows the number zero. We know what it's like to have an empty net. He said, Lord, we caught absolutely nothing. Jesus says, push out into the deep and let down your nets. Peter's looking at Jesus, and he's thinking, wait a minute. Out of the two guys here making a plan, one of us is a carpenter and one of us is a fisherman. Who ought to be making the plan here? Not him, but me. Not only that, but Peter is smart enough to know he's fished the Sea of Galilee since he was a kid. He knows that on the Sea of Galilee, you catch fish at nighttime in the shallow waters. When they come up to feed, you don't catch fish in the daytime out in the deep. That's not when they come out in the heat of the day. No, nighttime in the shallow waters. But Peter looks at Jesus, the carpenter, who says, I want you to do the exact opposite of what you know to be right. And what does Peter say? Nevertheless, at thy word. Is that not something every believer ought to learn to say? Nevertheless, at thy word. And obedience is what brought the blessing. When he led down the net and he obeyed the Lord, that's when he brought the blessing. And here's the last thing. Real faith hears and believes and obeys, but real faith rests. It rests because she that night... Went to bed. Rahab did. She went to bed that night. She went to sleep knowing, I don't know if it's going to be tomorrow or the next day or a week from now or a month from now. But one of these days, that entire mob of people out there on the plains of Moab, they're going to come over here and something's going to happen and God's going to give them this city. But Rahab didn't toss and turn. She wasn't sick at her stomach. She wasn't pacing the floor. She wasn't swigging Pepto-Bismol. She wasn't doing any of those things. She rested. Why? Because she believed the word of God. And when we believe the word of God, we can rest in faith and trust him. And that's exactly what she did. She said, I trust him. I really do. I trust him. You know what? She lived on the wall. I told you earlier on, that was the most fortified part of the city. She could have said, listen, I live on the most fortified part of the city. I don't have to live this, leave this rope here. This wall's not coming down. But you know what? Thankfully, she didn't have a false sense of security. There's too many people today who have a false sense of security. Too many people who think, I'm going to be okay. I'm a good person. I'm going to make it to heaven because I'm a good person and I don't do a lot of bad things. A false sense of security. I want to tell you, listen, when the walls start to fall, you better have obeyed the Lord and done what the Lord told you to do if you want to be saved. 
And when that day came and the walls began to fall, she was saved because she not only heard the word and believed it, but she also obeyed it and then rested in it, which she trusted the Lord. I got to tell you what, um, I came across a scripture, I've read it many times and you have too in the Psalms where it says, he, he who keeps Israel shall neither sleep nor slumber. And I love that verse, he who keeps Israel. God Almighty never sleeps nor slumbers, never takes a nap, never goes to bed, doesn't have a pair of pajamas, he doesn't go, he doesn't take any rest whatsoever. God is up 24 hours a day, amen? You know what I did the last time I read that verse? I thought, then I don't need to stay up all night worrying about something because God's already up watching it. He'll take care. I can sleep because he's going to stay up and watch it. I think Rahab said the same thing that night. She said they might have a secret attack in the middle of the night. I don't know, but I'm not going to stay up and worry about it because there's already somebody that's up. And he's already watching and he's already taking care of it. And that day when they came and the walls began to crack and rumble and they began to fall apart, every part of the wall, the Bible says, fell down flat except one part. Her house, because she was the one who believed, and everybody that was in her house who joined her in faith, they were saved too. Her parents and her siblings and those who joined her in that house, they were saved because they believed. Stand tonight, would you, and here's what I want to say as we close. I want to have more faith. I really do. I want God to give me more faith, and I hope that that's your prayer tonight. Faith is an opportunity. Sometimes we get many opportunities. Some of us have had thousands of opportunities to hear the gospel, thousands of opportunities to act on faith. And then some, like the thief on the cross, only had one. Thief on the cross, I think he gets a bad rap. People say, well, he waited till his very last opportunity to get saved. But that may be true, but you know what, the way I read it, it also seems like it was his first opportunity. It seems like it was the first time he'd ever heard about Jesus. The first time he'd ever laid his eyes on the master. But whether it was his first or not, faith is an opportunity. Every day is an opportunity to say, I either believe or I don't. And tonight, I want to believe. And I want to say what that father did. Lord, I do believe. I do believe. Do you believe tonight? Lift your hand. I do believe, Lord. But help thou my unbelief and increase my faith. Father, tonight, as we close this service, Lord, my prayer is that you would make us champions of faith.